My name is Leslie Thompson. I am Director of Adult Programs here at the Sid Richardson Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. And I want to thank y'all for joining us for our lecture program. Before I introduce our guest speaker, um, I first want to respectfully acknowledge all Native American peoples who have lived on this land since time immemorial. And I especially want to acknowledge and pay respect to the Wichita and affiliated tribes, which include the Waco, Kichai, Tawakoni, and Talavea, upon whose historical homeland I am conducting this evening's program. And while I recognize that a simple statement is insufficient to support the rights and well being of Indigenous peoples, I like to use this land acknowledgement as a reminder to continue to educate myself and others on the past and present histories of Native communities, both in North Texas and beyond, like those represented in our collection, um, as seen in paintings by Charles Russell um, that you'll see on display in our galleries. Now, during his residence in Montana, Russell encountered Indigenous people both on the Northern Plains of the state and from neighboring tribes in Canada and Alberta. He incorporated Hantock, also known as Plains Indian Sign Language, into his paintings, which reveal those experiences. Unlike most of non-Native and non-Deaf artists of this time period, Charles Russell was a unique artist uh, who portrayed the Plains Natives using authentic tribal signs. He lived in an area where hand talk was an important communication system among the Plains Natives, and Russell personally learned signs and included them in his paintings, as we will learn about tonight with the help of Dr. Melanie McKay Cody, who is a Cherokee Deaf Assistant Professor at the University of Arizona in the Department of Disability and Psychoeducational Studies. She earned her doctoral degree in linguistic and sociocultural anthropology at the University of Oklahoma. She has studied critically endangered indigenous sign languages in North America since 1994, while helping different tribes preserve their tribal signs. She specialized in indigenous deaf studies and interpreter training, incorporating native culture, North American Indian sign language and American sign language. She is an educator and advocate for indigenous interpreters and students in educational settings. And in addition to North American Indian Sign Language research, she has taught American Sign Language classes in several universities, schools, and communities for over 42 years. And she is one of eight founders of Turtle Island Hand Talk, a new group focused on indigenous deaf hard of hearing and deaf, blind and hearing people. Before I let Dr. McKay Cody take over, I wanna bring your attention to a couple of Zoom features. Um, the first is the chat box. Um, and this is where you can leave comments during the lecture. And I will actually help you test your chat box skills by asking everyone that if you are watching this lecture at home with others, if you will please type into the chat box how many folks are there with you. Um, this will help us better accurately record our attendance numbers since uh, we can't see you. So we don't know how many people are behind each device that logs on. So I appreciate that. And then the second feature I wanna bring your attention to is the Q&A box. Um, if at any point during the presentation you have a question related to Dr. McKay Cody's presentation, uh, please type your question there so that we can collect them all in one place. And with that, I will mute my mic, turn off my camera, and let you take it from here, Dr. McKay Cody. Thank you so much. The interpreter cannot see Melanie. So please hold. So sorry, we're going to go ahead and get started. We have a total of 83 slides. So I'm very excited to get started tonight. So 
So I've been working with several museums and this specific museum since July. Um, I had people submitting paintings who wanted me to look at them and provide interpretations. So I'm going to go ahead. I have always been interested in studying these things. For about 28 years, I've been aware of these paintings, but I've never had the time to focus on them until this wonderful opportunity provided to me by the Richardson Museum. Look at Russell's paintings that include hand talk. Please advance. I want to recognize and acknowledge the Wichita tribe, the Comanche tribe, the Jumano tribe, and the Kickapoo tribe. The four of them are the original residents of Texas, and these are their ancestral lands. I'd like to recognize those tribes whose signs are used in this area from long ago and passed on through the generations. So these are the local tribes and you've seen the signs for their tribes. I happen to currently be in Arizona and I want to acknowledge and recognize the Tohono O'odham, the Yaki on whose lands I stand. These are their ancestral lands. I work here. I work with several people who are members of the Tohono Odo tribe, and I give respect and homage to their sites for allowing me to present and to work with their peoples. Thank you. These are two important people who've recently passed. One was my father, Al McKay. He taught me farming and gardening. He grew up cowboying. He took me to places where they had rodeos. So I grew up going to rodeos with my dad. I'm his cowgirl. We were very close. He knew a lot about rodeo, horsemanship, farm life, and he really made me who I am today. The other person is Willie LeClaire. Although I met him more recently, he was a fluent Indian signer. He used Shoshone sign language fluently. We recently lost him. He had been involved in my research group as a sign model. We're working on a dictionary to preserve native sign languages. He was truly an amazing person, had a wonderful sense of humor. We talked about rodeo life, cowboy life. I really enjoyed his camaraderie during meetings. I will miss him a lot. They both made a great impact on my life and I want to honor them. It is good. Some of you don't know who I am. And so I'd like to share with you a little bit about me. I am a multitasker. There are lots of things I'm involved in. I'm a linguist and a sociocultural anthropologist. I typically study indigenous deaf people and native signs. Those are my primary fields. I'm also an archaeologist. I've studied rock art, rock writing, picture writing that shows sign language within it. My bachelor's degree is in art history that helps give me a rich understanding of art and the history of art in my work. I'm a member of the native deaf community. I am descended from the four tribes you see on the slide. I am a mother, I am a grandmother, and of course, I am a cowgirl. I think it's important to have a basic understanding of the area we're talking about when we're talking about hand talk. And that term hand talk is used in the Indian deaf and also in the hearing Indian community. Most people use the 
the term hand talk. We sign it like this. For linguistic purposes, for the specific signed languages I study, they are in the Plains Indian Sign Language family. And you can see the Plains area there in red on the slide. I've studied different tribes, Southwest Regional Native American Sign Language. In November, I'm going to try to find any remnants of signing from the Northeastern United States. I would typically work with tribes to help them preserve their hand talk lexicons. This is a summary picture of my work. Hand talk is a general term for any native signed language used in North America. I have been studying this for 29 years. I've been able to work with many different tribes and it's important for you to understand uh, how this applies to Charles Russell's work. The blue, we're talking about North American Indian Sign Language. Then we break it down into regions. The Plains is the region that I study the most. And then in the green are the specific tribes that fall under that region. So even sometimes there are two tribes who live close together on neighboring lands they may have different signs between their signed languages. And I am going to talk more about what uh, C.M. Russell encountered and the tribes he interacted with. So again, North American Indian Sign Language is the overarching or umbrella term. Plains Indian Sign Language is the regional hand talk. The items in the green are the tribes Charles Russell associated with. We know for sure he associated with 11 tribes, many in northern Montana and on into Alberta, Canada. So you see the Cree, the Crow, the Blackfoot, Haigan, that's Canadian tribe. The Sakri, he really interacted with a lot of Native peoples during his time in Montana. A little bit about Russell. He's the man who painted this body of work. Here are some photographs of him. I've always been quite impressed with his work. Like I said earlier, I've been fascinated for at least 29 years. He was very advanced as an artist for his time. I look at his artistic work as language documentation, a different documentation than those of us who just write transcripts. He lived on the land. He developed his art from the land. He did anthropological studies of the people with the signs. So I feel like he was really ahead of his time. I've always been quite impressed with his work. He really has a lot to offer. Uh, most cowboy artists did not paint any Indian signers or any signs. They may have uh, shown people in action in their daily life or just standing there on a landscape. But I think that this may have been a point of pride for him because he himself could sign. He visited Indian signers and they communicated with each other. According to stories, it says that the Native people trusted him, felt honored to be painted. He gave them paintings as gifts. They very much treasured those paintings and those gifts. They felt like he was really giving them something of value. They often would give him something in return. So they felt him as a very trustworthy person. Next, I want to look at some of the signs in some of the paintings, and I'm going to focus on some of the different hand shapes that are in the pictures. You can see this drawing here of the V hand shape. Now understand that this could mean many different things. It could be to look, and that is directional to look forward, backwards, right or left. It could also mean dog, this sign, the V moving across the front of the face. 
It could mean lie with the view sliding across the mouth. It has many different meanings. But unfortunately, in painting, the sign is frozen. So without movement, it makes it difficult to ascertain the actual meaning. So what we often do is I will uh, uh, confer with someone who uses hand talk to make sure that my interpretation is correct and that the meaning matches the setting or the environment that's being painted. Okay, so let's move on. So now I would like you to do an exercise. Look at this painting and see if you can see the sign. I'll give you a minute to look at this painting. Now I'm gonna move on and I will show you actually where it is in the painting. So in this, this uh, painting, it might be that he's saying, look at this woman who's working sitting next to me, how hard she's working. It could also mean maybe he's telling a story about a dog, but we're not able to determine that because of the lack of movement. There's always two or three possible interpretations of the signs in the paintings. So if we could see the movement, it could indicate whether he's saying, look at the woman next to me working or look at the dog or talking, telling a story about a dog. So now look at this painting and see if you can find the sign. Let's look at the next painting. Next. Another one. This is the last one in this group. So now you'll notice that all of them are similar in this hand shape. They're all using this sign. So you notice the pattern. All of the riders, all the horseback riders are all using that same sign. So there's a connection between them. And that indicates ontology within the paintings. There are some other signs that may not have been noticed. They're easy to overlook, but they're there. Let's look at another one. In this painting, there are actual two signs. See if you can find them. Okay, so do you see the gentleman straight forward in the middle? He's doing this the V on the chest. He's the interpreter for Lewis and Clark. But there might have missed the woman. There's an old woman who's shorter. She also has a V on a chest, on her upper breast bone. She's standing next to the TP. I'll show you a close up of both of them. The picture on the right of the gentleman, that's the interpreter. We believe his name is Dullard. We think that's who he is. He was acting as an interpreter for Lewis and Clark on their journey. And then the woman on the left, you can see her using the V hand shape as well. So I was able to find both of those in that one painting. It could be the woman is saying like, look, there's an important conversation over there. We need to be paying attention to what they're talking about. That's one possible interpretation. Okay, so now we have another one that also has two signs. See if you can find them. And here they are. 
the pictures are a little bit blurry. I apologize for the quality. The picture on the right, the gentleman is signing two. He's indicating two girls. So it could be $2, but it is clearly the number two. And what's interesting here, I believe this is the sign for dog or an animal. And above the painting, you can see the three animals drawn. This sign does not always mean dog. It can mean any small animal or a group of small animals. I actually learned that um, through working at Hand Talk. Um, so it could mean dog, but also small animal. So that was interesting find for myself. Here's another one. This is they're talking. This is a storytelling. It's possible he's talking about a horse walking, or it could be a dog. But this is a, an example of storytelling, and Charles Russell um, is sitting there listening to the individual. But it's a letter that was written about the story being told. So now we're going to move on to the fist hand shape, which can be thumb up, thumb down. So we're going to look at examples of that in paintings. Take a look in this painting and see if you can see an example of the fist hand shape. Again, I apologize for the quality of the picture. I believe it's either this, which means signature, or it is this, the cross in the hand or they're signing to write. So one of those three options that could be indicated here. So it could be any of these. But they all mean, to some extent, a signature, sign your name. This one is fascinating. Look at the people's head and how they're turned. I spoke with a hand talker who indicated they think it's this sign that I'm exhibiting now. If that is the case, it could mean brave. It could mean wow, an emphatic expression, or it could mean very good. So there are three possible interpretations here. So it could be an indication of saying, wow, look at all the wagons approaching. It could also mean you're brave to come to our country. Or maybe it means good. But look at the head. He is actually looking back towards the painter and everyone else is looking in the opposite direction. So maybe this gentleman is a friend of Charles Russell. We don't know. Take a look at this picture and see if you can find the hand shape. See, the hand shape is this, it's the thumb on the side of the fist. We're not sure which sign is being produced. It could be this, which means respect, or it could be something else. It's hard to tell, but it is that hand shape. So now we have the hand shape, either one finger, index finger, or both hands with an index finger. Look in this picture and see if you can see that hand shape. The sign being produced is this, which means either to buy or to sell. But if you notice, they have packed, their pa horses are packed, which means they have things that they want to sell. So this sign in this in this painting means to sell.
this artwork is more than impressive. I was with the museum people and we we spent so much time, I would say probably at least 30 minutes talking about the importance of this painting. It's very impressive. And this is another, this is why I said that Charles Russell is early for his time. He's advanced for his time. A lot of people in art history believe that he pant painted in the romantic perspective, romanticism. I come from a different lens. I see a sign in this painting. I don't know if you see Sacagawea. She's standing here in the painting on the boat. And if you notice, all of the men are still. No one is talking. There's no discussion. There's movement, no movement. When I look at this painting, I feel like the importance is on Sacagawea. She's being recognized as the native interpreter. And her role is critical. And Charles Russell is showing the honor of her, a native woman. To us native interpreters, we feel that she is standing ahead to be recognized. And that passes on today to our interpreters today. And being a woman, you can see the woman, the baby on her back. She's representing the ability to navigate two worlds, two cultures, and able to share those. She's inter she's intermediary between the two. And the boat and the distance is approaching the boat that Sacagawea is in. I feel like the focus is on just this exact woman. So I cannot emphasize the importance enough. And here is where you see the sign. She plays a very important role for the deaf native community and the native interpreting community. So again, this painting in particular shows that Charles Russell was ahead of his time. Here's another example. If you'll take a look at this painting. I think this one is easy to find. This means to set up camp. So he's he's saying we're going to set camp here. Okay. Take a look at this one and see if you can find the the sign. This is representing people. It could be saying, I'm going to go see my people. As you can see all of the, the people down below in the town. And so it's re being represented that I'm going to go see my people. Has everyone found it in this painting? Okay, so there's two. There's this one on the left. That was the person in the middle. And then on the right, you see the picture of the V on the upper breast. You always see this person looking over to the side to say, look. Here's another painting. This is a painting that is telling the story of a young man on his journey to become a man. So you see this hand shape? It's the sign for man, a singular index finger. Now we will be going through and talking about the examples of the open and closed five hand shape. See what you can see in this painting.
Look at this one. Look again for that five hand shape. Here are the close ups. That sign means wait. That sign has been carried on until today. There are a lot of people who use hand talk who sign that sign. Even gestures people use today means to wait. This is an interesting story happening in this painting. This is a trading post. And the story that it's talking about is Charles Russell and an Indian of mixed blood both go into a store and they ask for a bag of tobacco. The store owner charges one of them a nickel. They leave and go out the door. Then the native person goes in and says, I want to get some tobacco. They want to buy the same bag of tobacco. And they're charged a dime or 10 cents for the bag of tobacco. This sign means good. It's good. So they leave and go out of the trading post. They're friends of Russell and they're telling him it's not good. They lied. They lied or the store owner is lying or not doing good business with them. So that's the story. Look at this one for a moment. You see the signs for good. Look at this painting. See if you can identify where my, a sign might be. Here it is, that open five hand shape. There's somebody standing off to the side. The sign is go or let's go this way. We're going to go. It could be made with a questioning expression as in, should we go this way or are we going this way? Here's another painting, look it over. The story behind this picture, and you can see the stream or the river. You might wonder why the boat's on fire. This is an allegory or a metaphor. They're signing fire. They're signing fire because it's a steamboat. And so it has a smokestack. So they're signing that fire sign to talk about the steamboat. The same with trains. I've seen a lot of people who use hand talk sign this fire sign up in the air, meaning a steam boat, a steam powered boat or the iron horse, the railroad. So again, that sign is alluding to that steam or smoke coming out of the top. It's really important to think about how the sign is being performed and how it connects to the environment or the context in which it's depicted. Let's look at this one. So they're wanting to eat or looking for food, maybe requesting food. Do you have food? The sign is clearly food or eat. Next, we're going to look for this curved L hand shape performed like this. Let's look at the painting. This 
this sign refers to bison. Signs that have both a V and a five type hand shape, like depicted in this painting. The story behind this is that there's a cowboy up at the front, or some cowboys, and they're talking about going over the ridge there. They're talking about going over the mountain. And they're asking, where's the rest of the group, or where's the other group? So this sign that's happening could be a noun or a verb. Talking about writing or writers. It could be something like he went that way on horse or I've been riding all day. I've been riding for hours or I need a horse to ride. There are many possibilities for interpreting this sign. There are two signs happening in this painting. A sign like this could either mean directions are being given, like cut through the mountain pass, or it could be talking about how far away something is. And again, we see this V hand shape, this look over here. Notice any time that there's a landscape, this look sign is often present. Looking for a five hand shape and another hand being held. It's important to know the story background behind this. So one of these gentlemen is a wolfer, somebody who kills wolves. And this was happening around the 1830s to the 1850s. And a lot of them were killed, which is why the numbers dwindled. You see all the stakes here. There are two people working as wolfers, and there are some native signs in this. One like this, who's trying to figure out what's happening. They're asking the hand talker, I think that perhaps this is a compound sign where the grasping would be interpreted as capture to capture something or catch something. And this sign is give. That's one potential interpretation. I need to contact the Blackfeet for their specific signs. I have not gotten the reply from them so far on this. Look in this painting. Another instance of this sign that may have something to do with capture. But there's something else too. You can see the one who's on horseback with this V sign. So for the next picture, really look at the group of pictures and then I will explain what's happening. There's one with this V hand shape, but then we see all of these with the hand over the top of the eyes. They're blocking the sun out with their hands. And you can tell by the expressions on their faces, they're trying to look far away. 
That has now morphed into a sign in the Native community, especially in the deaf Native community. Hand talkers use this sign. That is a contemporary sign that is still in use in the community. It's from an indigenous perspective for Scout. You see the person with their hand raised. Some people have asked me about the stereotypical uh, translation of this in English, how. This sign has a purpose. It has a function. It means I'm here. I'm present. I come in peace. I intend this meeting to be peaceful. There's no fighting or war at this time. Or it can also mean stop so that everyone in the party stops. So there are different translations depending on the context. But this idea of how is straight from Hollywood. And we can cast that interpretation aside. So we see the hand in the air again here. In closing, I want to acknowledge and thank all of these people. Leslie Thompson, who opened our webinar today, I thank you for helping to set up this webinar for everyone. The Ammon Carter Museum in Fort Worth. There were four people that I met with this past July and talked with them in developing this presentation. The Charles M. Russell Museum in Great Falls. I was able to speak with Sarah, who helped me with the titles of the paintings. I really thank her. The Montana Historical Society. They've got beautiful pictures that I was able to work with that helped me greatly. The Gilcrease Museum in Oklahoma was of great service to me with pictures. My interpreters, Amy and Heather, I give them thanks. Christina, my graphic designer, helped me get the pictures ready for this presentation. I thank all of them for their contribution to this presentation and to the slides. I do so appreciate all of their help. Thank you so much. It has been good. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. McKay Cody. Well, we still have uh, a little bit of time remaining. Um, we can take questions. So if you have a question for Dr. McKay Cody, please put it in the Q&A box um, so I can share that with her. We will be, we are recording this program. Um, so we do plan to post uh, the recording onto our YouTube channel later um, next month. So if you have a question for Dr. McKay Cody, go ahead and put it into the Q&A box. Uh, let's see. Here's a question. I noticed you used a sign that looks like kill with a T hand shape. Does that have a specific meaning? Um, I don't recall that. This would be the sign for kill. But no, I don't I don't remember seeing the sign for kill. The the standard American sign language sign. Another question. Do you find cognates between the various regions regarding hand talk? Yes. That was the, the list that I showed, the green, the final part of that chart, the tribal signs, yes. There, those are the tribal signs. So that means that, that a specific tribe within that community uses signs, which are different across the different tribes. That's the third part of that chart. Um, was hand talk commonly used by everyone in the tribe or just deaf people? Oh, no, everyone, deaf and hearing. 
anyone in the community. And today, many um, hearing individuals in my research, I find a balance between the deaf signers and non-deaf signers, even today. Has hands, hand talk changed much since the time of these paintings? If so, is it possible there are other meanings for the signs as language has evolved? No, most of them have been carried on and they've maintained their meaning. It's called intergenerational transmission. Many of the signs um, that are in the paintings today, current PS, uh, Plains Indian Sign Language users can identify the signs. So they are the same. How and when did you first hear about Charles Russell? Twenty-eight years ago, <laughs> and how? Well, actually, it's kind of a funny story. I was reading something, and I contacted uh, Sid Ridden. I did contact the individual, and uh, I was given a postcard. And years and years passed. Um, it was kind of it was fate. It came about, and. Um, the individual reached out to me and I thought, oh, fate is working here. Um, but so other people have reached out to me and um, they have examples of Charles, uh, Charles Russell. And then we came across multiple paintings. Sometimes people, I, we come across a few, but then we find more. And I say, yes, we are always finding more. So far I've identified 38 signs with, uh, sorry, 38 paintings with signs but there are many paintings in which we have not counted the signs or have not been identified yet. There's a few questions um, related to um, how and why Charles Russell learned and continued to use sign language, if you learned about that at all in your research. Yes, um, he was from St. Louis, he grew up there. He, he really had a very strong desire to go to Montana. He was a very restless child. At the age of 16, he decided that he was going to go with one person, an older adult, and they took a train to Montana and then they took a wagon until they finally arrived uh, to Judith uh, Basin and became a cowboy. And there he met native individual and he came across multiple native people and started learning signs because of the communication with them. He wasn't able to communicate with them because he spoke English and they spoke their native language. So it was an alternative way of communication. So he learned a sign language for that reason. Additionally, uh, he has a deaf person. Well, he was white, he is not indigenous himself. Um, but there was an individual who became deaf at the age of 18, never learned American Sign Language, but did start learning Indian Sign Language in Oklahoma. So this person had heard about Charles Russell and decided that he wanted to, through friends, uh, they knew a gentleman named Tom Mix. Um, they were involved in Hollywood movies way back in the past. So they knew each other, Tom Mix and this gentleman. Uh, he was from Dewey, Oklahoma, which is very far north, just at the border the very northern tip, okay, so Dewey, Oklahoma. So he picked up sign language from Cherokee, Osage, and there was another tribal um, uh, language that he picked up. And then he ended up meeting CMR because he was also interested in art. So this gentleman moved and started learning Plains Indian Sign Language as well after moving to be closer to CMR. And CMR would sign with him to communicate with this deaf individual. And so the two of them remained friends for a very long time. Um, and he passed away in 1926, um, born in 1864, but as I said, passed away in 1926, approximately 70 years old. But um, this gentleman would go and visit different reservations across the country. And he would just talk to people, have conversations with them using uh, Indian sign language, native sign languages. He was very well accepted 
and he corresponded with them and he would draw pictures, paint pictures for them and, and give it to them as gifts. He was very good to Native people. And as I said earlier in my presentation, the Native individuals highly respected him. There's, you know, he was a an, uh, an, an, uh, deaf protege, but he also would go and go to the reses, um, but he was able, he was free to visit the different reservations and visit different tribes. So through his socialization and his travels, he learned the sign, sign languages. Have you studied the sign languages of other indigenous cultures around the world? Just curious if there are similarities you've seen across cultures. Well, talking about other countries, no. My focus is on NISL, which is North Northern American Indian Sign Language. That includes Canada, the United States. I have never studied an example um, in Mexico or anywhere in South America. Um, I have met people from South America. Um, and I've asked questions, you know, just to learn some of their signs. For example, this. It, it's a, that's the way they point. Use a lip point. That is very similar. We see that in Alberta, all the way down to South America. And all of them do share that. <laughs> that's one example of, uh, of something that we find across uh, the different countries. Um, but it also depends um, if it's a noun, like clothing, food, ceremony, animals, we find differences among the tribes. That's why we separate the signs based on the tribal usage, because there are variations. Do you have any recommendations about how people can learn more about hand talk? Any good resources? Yes, um, my group is actually developing a video dictionary. Um, we've started that. We actually been doing this for the past year. We are collecting signs across tribes. Um, so far we have nine uh, tribes represented. We're expecting one or two more to join our group. Um, but our goal is to record signs and put them into this visual dictionary. Someday, once it's completed, then um, we will also develop an app that can be used to access the signs. But this dictionary belongs to the Native people. It's not, it's not gonna be widely publicly shared because the language belongs to the Native people. So the dictionary will be developed and we will pass it on to each tribe and then they make a decision as how that will be shared or not. Some signs are signs that they do not want to be shared publicly. They're sacred signs. So I am giving them that power. I'm just doing the research. I'm providing them the tools to preserve their languages. And our research group has, um, we have a native research assistant. We also have students who are doing editing who are also native. I'm trying to keep the project within the community among indigenous people. And just, maintain it among Native people. We do have some Native, non-Native researchers who are very good with doing editing. They're also good with, you know, we're, we're teaching them respect for Native languages. We, I've had some people reach out to me for selfish reasons and I declined to work with them. I said, no, you will not exploit the work we're doing. I will not work with you because your reasons are not authentic. Sometimes even people from other countries have reached out to me. And I said, no, the work we're doing belongs to the Native people. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. McKay Cody, for sharing your uh, knowledge uh, with us and your research. And I'm so excited about all the work that you continue to do. Um, I wanna thank our interpreters for helping out this evening. And I wanna thank all of you at home watching um, and sharing your questions with us. I know I learned a lot tonight and I, I hope you did too. And I hope that you have a good rest of your evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Good night.